Hi, welcome to How to D&D. My name is Fred Weller, and today I want to talk about Dungeons and Dragons. And usually I talk about Dungeons and Dragons 5e, but I thought I would talk about being a beginner dungeon master. And this is supposed to be kind of like a workshop. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to present you with a whole lot of information, and near the end of it, you are welcome to ask questions. Now, that's before the live stream ends. You are quite welcome to ask whatever question you have. I will do my best to answer those questions. And I mean live, not after I've posted it and in the comments anyway. So don't worry about that. It's not going to just wrap up just like that. So the first thing I'm going to say is there is a guy called Sly Flourish. He has a website. It's a very good website. He's been doing this for a long time. His name is Mike Show. I have talked about him before. He also has a PDF, it's like a, an online book, which provides you with a lot of really useful information. And I feel like my lights are not on, hang on. Well, that's one light, let's turn the other one on. Okay, my lights are on, so hopefully my face is a bit more visible. So essentially, I would suggest going and checking out his web page. I will provide a link to Sly Flourish in the description when the video is finished, so you can actually go and check out his stuff. And I will probably also provide you with a link to his, his PDF book called The Lazy Dungeon Master, because it's got some really useful information in there. And he has a whole lot of information that he talks about in terms of how you start off as a beginner. And the first thing you need to deal with is finding a group of people to play with. And I've always said, look, go with people you know. It's always best to use somebody that you know, friends, family, always the best option. And then if you want to sort of develop things, you can start integrating people that you don't know. But when you're starting out, start with people that you do. Uh, I highly recommend using the starter set rather than going and buying all the other stuff. And you can get the rules for free online, but primarily uh, the reason for getting the starter set is the adventure called The Lost Mine of Fandalva, which is inside. You want that particular adventure because it's such a good one to run when you're starting out for the very first time. Uh, the next thing I'm going to say is, look, you need to at least read the rules and have a basic idea of the rules. The core rules are pretty simple. And if you are unsure how those rules work, you are bound to find somebody who's done a whole lot of videos online, not just me, there are other people as well, who ha can explain to you how those rules work. And I would say that my channel does a lot of rules videos, but you can also check out places like Dawnforge Cast does some occasionally. You can also check out Don't Stop Thinking, they also, you know, he's, I think CJ does quite a lot of uh, animated videos that explain how the game works. They're a little bit complicated sometimes, but, you know, break them down, watch them in small chunks. And there are other websites that will explain things. I think the Digital Dungeon Master, um, they're a bit more advanced. I feel like his videos are pretty much leveled at somebody who's experienced rather than a beginner but there's another place where you can look at how the rules actually work. Make sure you read your adventure at least once. I mean, you can read it twice, that's fine too, but it is important to at least read your adventure. I know a lot of people say, look, make your own, own adventure, but start with a small adventure, and this is why I suggest the Lost Mine of Fandalva, because it is short and it's pretty easy to run. Uh, watch live play. So if you can't watch somebody actually playing the game, then you should be able to get onto YouTube and watch people playing the game. Um, you don't have to watch a lot of it, but it will give you sort of a basic idea of how the turns work and how the interaction between the dungeon master and the players work by checking out stuff on YouTube or if you can go into a game store and watch people playing for real, like face to face, that's also really useful. And you can go and learn how the rules work by just joining something like the, the Dungeons & Dragons Adventurers League and going and playing in a store close to you. Or you can also play online. 
Um, you shouldn't have an issue finding somebody who will provide you with an option to either see how it's played or play with them so you can pick up the rules and how it all sort of flows. Reinforcing motivations. Um, when the players get together, try to get them to actually create a motivation for being together and taking the adventure. Don't do all the work yourself. Uh, be as lazy as you possibly can. Get them to do some of the work. If they can't come up with an idea, then you might need to do some of that yourself. And if you're unsure, there's always somebody out there on the internet who will give you advice about how to bring your characters together. But you do, you need to give them some sort of context and background information to do that. Uh, next, I would say connecting the characters. Make sure they aren't bringing lone wolf characters into the group because that's really hard to work with as a new dungeon master. I would suggest making sure that you uh, provide them with uh, like a list. Usually I have a list of different connections that the players could use and they select two. And they try to connect with two other players' characters at their table. And that's really useful. You don't have to do it, but I find it really useful to tying them together so we don't have somebody trying to throw a spanner in the works and work against the rest of the group. Because Dungeons and Dragons ultimately is a team effort. So you have to teach them how to be a team. And uh, the first part is making sure they have connections that each of them uh, accept and understand. Improvising. So you need to prepare to impro improvise. And there is a couple of ways you can actually do that. I have videos that explain how to improvise. And I also have a few videos uh, talking about story cubes so you can train yourself so you're better at actually improvising in your game or you can use things like plot twist cards I have videos on that particular topic as well uh, you can also look at some of the stuff that's been put on the internet YouTube's only got a little bit of information on improvising so you might need to sort of look around quite a lot but I have done a few videos on that particular topic so you can learn how to improvise and you will find heaps and heaps of tips from Sly Flourish's website that's slyflourish.com explaining how to improvise and I'm actually going to go through some of the different techniques that you can use uh, as we go through this workshop. Uh, next I would say use the players ideas. You don't have to come up with all the ideas. If the players say something um, that's off topic or come up with an idea or just suggest it or uh, it's just off, off the side, you know, tongue in cheek, uh, I would actually jump on that and use it, particularly if you're unsure how to proceed. Use the, the information that's provided to you from the players, really, really helpful. Next, be nice, be nice to your players. When you're starting out as a new dungeon master, you're gonna make mistakes, so be nice to your players and be nice to their characters. They're starting off probably at level one. Level one is really brutal, and uh, they're probably only getting to grips with the game, so be gentle with them. Don't go throwing really nasty, heavy stuff at them straight away. Try to sort of just, um, just, just try some small stuff. Don't need to get too heavy on, uh, on the encounters. No, no dragons at level one, okay? When you're beginning, no dragons at level one. <laughs> I mean, you could do it, but I just feel like that's a bit rough. Uh, next, choose, um, choose some maps that you can utilize in your game. So if they don't provide a map, do a photocopy of the map area. Uh, the Lost Mine of Thandalba actually provides you with maps. So print them out and provide them to your, your players because they will find them so useful and it'll make life so much easier for you. Now you don't need to reveal the entire dungeon, but particularly with an area map so they know where they can go, that's really helpful. Um, that'll speed things up for you. And you can find on, um, on, in, on the internet usually maps that don't include, include like secret doors and um, special locations or markings that the, the players shouldn't know about or their characters shouldn't know about. It's quite possible that you will find all the maps you need and they won't have any markers that are for the dungeon master only. Um, next I would say is at the end of your session, Ask for feedback from the players. 
I always ask for feedback. I always say, look, did everybody have a good time? Was there anything I could have done better? And you don't necessarily have to do everything that you are told, but it does show as a dungeon master that you are responsive to the player's needs and desires because ultimately you're all trying to have fun and that's one of the other things, okay? Don't just ask for feedback. Make sure that when you're running the session that you are having fun. If it's not fun for you, you shouldn't be doing it. Um, and it should be fun for your players as well. And it's all right to goof off. It really is. I know a lot of people say, oh, no, it should be serious. And you can't break character. And look, it's all right to goof off. Have a good time, you know. Don't worry about uh, being really strict. You don't have to run your game like an online YouTube or Twitch live stream from... Uh, some of these big names like uh, the Critical Role team or Inc Acquisitions Incorporated, even those people blow off steam. So you're allowed to too. Relax. I've said this before. I think this is probably the most important thing for a new beginner dungeon master is you do have to relax. And however you do that, whether you listen to music beforehand or you do it with a whole lot of people that you know well, who you feel comfortable with, or you drink a little bit of alcohol, don't get drunk, okay? Drinking a little bit of alcohol is fine. It'll help you mellow out. If you need a cup of tea or a... I don't think coffee is such a great idea, but I understand some people find that helpful. I think that probably you need to, I don't know, some calming tea rather than um, something that's going to, you know, heighten your awarenesses and, and make you really on edge. It's probably not a good idea to drink a whole lot of V, <laughs> okay? All right. So that is the basic gist of what I would suggest. Now there are a couple of other things that I would also suggest as a new dungeon master who's beginning, and that is, now you don't have to use a dungeon master screen. You don't have to buy one, you could make one, but the reason for having a dungeon master screen is so that you can put useful information that you can refer to so you don't have to look it up in the book all the time, so you're not always flipping through pages. It will save you a lot of time. You don't actually have, have to put the Dungeon Master screen between you and the players. I've seen Dungeon Masters who have put the Dungeon Master screen off to the side so that their players and they can see it. Or they just move it over to the side and all their rolling's done in, in the open, uh, but anything that they don't want the players to see is behind the Dungeon Master screen. But also, too, it's a good place for sort of hanging little tags off. So if you're setting up your your encounters, your combat encounters, and you need to sort out initiative, you can obviously jot that down on a piece of paper or a board or something. But often if you have like a little tag that you can put on top of your dungeon master screen, you can move them around. When they call out their initiative, you can shift them around. It means you can visually see where they are and the rest of the players at the table can see where they stand in their particular combat order. So that's really helpful too. But information on the back of the Dungeon Master screen is the key reason for having it. Is that's what you want the Dungeon Master screen for. Next, a random list of names. Female and male names. And if you can't get that, get yourself an app that can generate random names for you on your phone. That's what I would suggest you do. Random names, really helpful. Useful for when you have to be on the fly and suddenly you have to produce a name for something that you don't know the name of because it never had a name in the adventure, or they went and did something you weren't expecting. Uh, another really useful thing to have is like a list of random encounters. So if the adventure doesn't provide you with random encounters, then what I want you to do is actually create a chart with random encounters. And if that's too hard, then go and find somebody who's already created a random chart of encounters and use that. Uh, lists of weapons and armor, so that's how much damage they do and some of their properties and how much they cost. Literally just photocopy out of the player's handbook the section on armor and weapons because I can't count the number of times I've had to refer to those pages because the players aren't sure how much something weighs or how much it costs or how much damage it does and they don't know which dice to use. You will find that really useful to have that available. I've already talked about knowing the rules, the basic rules. And look, if you don't know all of the rules, that's all right. 
Learn what you can and fake the rest. Yes, I'm, I'm serious. Fake the rest. You can sort things out later on if you, if you made an error and uh, your faking was incorrect. Just fake it. Okay. Next, uh, I would say avoid trying to control the player's characters. It's very tempting when you're controlling the story and the monsters and the NPCs to wind up controlling the player's character as well. Let them do that work. That's their problem, not yours. You just tell them what happens in the environment and what the NPCs and the monsters do. So when they're swinging their sword or they're using their weapon or casting a spell, get them to describe that stuff, not you. And also don't tell them what their characters are feeling. They should already know that. They should, and if they don't, leave it. It's not your problem. Let them deal with that. Let them control their own character. Uh, next, ask the players lots of questions. When they give you only a small amount of information and you just don't have enough information to play with, keep asking questions till you get the information you need to proceed. Very, very helpful to have a lot of information from your players. And it will also, um, it will build out the game, make it a little bit longer, uh, but it will fill up time, which is helpful for you. And it will give you time to think and uh, yes, less thinking by you and more thinking by the players is always very, very useful. Uh, next. Oh, okay. This is the one that comes up quite a lot. And I get this question heaps and heaps and heaps. And I'm going to say it right now. Not every single dungeon master needs to be a voice actor. So if you can do voice voices like Matthew Mercer and Chris Perkins or something such like that, and you're comfortable doing it, awesome, great. Players love it, even when they're really bad. No, seriously, even when the Dungeon Master, quite often even when the Dungeon Master does really terrible voices, the players like it. Um, I've, I've got an example where one of the people at my table stayed at my table because I voice acted a unicorn, and it was awful. And he stayed at my table because I was willing to humiliate myself by trying to, uh, to act like a unicorn I mean, what does a unicorn say? What, how does a unicorn sound? I had no idea. But you don't have to do it, and don't worry if you can't. Not all dungeon masters need to be voice actors. That's just something that seems to have cropped up recently. It's a very modern view, and it, because of the internet, a lot of people think you have to do it, but you don't. What else have we got here? Um, oh, allow people to eat and drink at the table, and it's all right if they have their phone. Look, if you're worried about them taking their time somewhere else, it, just get them to put apps on their phone that involve playing the game. Whether there are character sheets on there, or there's a, an app for looking up their spells, or an app for going through the inventory. It, all those sorts of tools are really, really helpful to them, and they're just spreading themselves. If you're, if you're interesting enough, they will actually keep watching and listening and paying attention to you, but if they need to eat and drink, they're just trying to keep their bodies running and their mind uh, functioning, and they need food and drink, so let them do that. And remember, you need to take a break, which I'm gonna do right now, I'm gonna take a drink of water. So, when you need a break, whether it needs to be to go to the toilet, or just to take a break because your mind is sort of full of stuff and you're tired, Take a five minute break, take a 10 minute break, let them know that you'll be coming back and continuing on. And uh, don't make your sessions too long. You don't need to play for four hours. You know, one hour, two hours, whatever is gonna work for you is fine. And uh, yeah, make sure you take a break, you need a break. And so do they, you know, the players need a break too. They can take a break at any time and walk away. And I know sometimes dungeon masters feel like they have to stay there and they can't walk away from the table. It's actually good for you to take a break, so don't forget. Uh, what else have we got here? Oh, take your time. Sometimes you will talk too fast, you'll let your mind travel uh, too quickly, and your mouth will move, move faster than your brain is. So take your time and just actually lay it out, and if you need to stop and think, then, you know, I often will encourage off-topic conversations at the table with the players when I need to think. 
It's quite deliberate on my part. In fact, I will encourage it when I need to, but you also need to know how to bring them back. And probably the easiest way to say, um, bring them back is to say, look, okay, I'm ready, let's go, and just continue on. Probably the simplest way. There are other techniques, but we'll cover that some other time, I think. And what else have we got here? I've already talked about using pre-made adventures. It's really, really important to make sure you use a pre-made adventure rather than trying to put all the work on yourself and create your own masterpiece. Um, you don't have to run an adventure that's completely original. It is all right to use cliches. It is all right to steal from movies, books, old stories, myths, any of that sort of stuff. As time goes by, your stuff will develop. But you shouldn't be expected to be original when you start out. And uh, the players will understand. Don't worry about it. Uh, next. Expect your players to do things you were not expecting. Okay, I want you to realize now, no matter what happens, they're going to do something you weren't expecting. As soon as that happens, call a toilet break. <laughs> call a toilet break and go and have a break and have a think about it. I often do my best thinking in the toilet. And I will often take my phone with me and my pad and my paper. And I know that sounds disgusting, but it's true. Just make sure that once you're finished with the, the process of unloading, that you put your phone down and your notepad and your pen and paper before you pick up the toilet paper, okay? And you don't pick it up until you've washed your hands. That's the key thing I would say. Really important to remember. Okay, and lastly, I'm just going to reintegrate this particular point. You absolutely have to make sure you're having fun. And if you're not having fun, then you shouldn't dungeon master. Okay, just keep playing the game until you're ready. And make sure your players are having fun. If they want to do stuff and they're finding it entertaining, you can usually tell if people are having fun. One, you'll smile and laugh, and if your players are smiling and laughing, you know that they're having a good time. And that's all that really matters. And that's the gist of it. I am going to stay online for a little bit longer and answer questions if people have questions. And I suspect there will be a couple of questions that people have, and I will certainly answer those questions. Um, look, if you found this video helpful or informative, please share, like, and subscribe. Look, make a comment below. Uh, after this video if you have any questions and you weren't able to actually watch the live stream and for those of you who are here right now I am going to answer questions very very shortly that you might have and till next time where's my dice where's my dice till next time keep rolling those 20s